So today, I know the title's kind of ambiguous, like I said, Chad, if you wrote it. Um, but basically, I'm going to be talking about taking different algorithms that used to be a lot of times in like computer science and just algorithms uh, kind of that apply to life and applying them to different situations in life as well as cybersecurity, running a cybersecurity department, just kind of optimizing your work life in general in cybersecurity. Um, and so the way this uh, talk kind of came to be, I was listening to this like dumb, trashy podcast about dating and relationships. Um, actually, I was driving up to KC one day and, you know, it's just like girls gossiping or whatever. And then they had a guest speaker on the podcast who was a behavioral scientist. Um, and she started talking about how humans act against their own best interests and why we're really, you know, bad at like dating and marriage and all these things and taking a very scientific approach to it. So that was really interesting. And she, heard, she started talking about this computer science algorithm, um, which I'll talk about later in the talk. And she applied it to like dating, to optimize their dating lives. Like that's such an interesting concept. Um, and she referenced this book called Algorithms to Live By. Maybe some of you have heard of it or read it before. Um, and it, it basically takes, like I said, fundamental computer science algorithms and applies them to like daily things you can do in life. And immediately I was like, I need to read this book because that's so interesting to me. Um, I was an industrial operations engineering major. So like optimal processes is what really, really interests me. And I, I wish I would have done like a psychology double minor or double major or something. Cause I, I love the idea of like algorithms and how humans make choices coming together. Like, okay, I totally need to read this book. And I read it and basically every chapter in the book is a different algorithm and they apply it to life. And I thought, you know, that's such a cool concept. We can apply these to cybersecurity too, though, right? Because algorithms are just frameworks for how to do things. And that's kind of how this talk was born. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I picked three of my favorite algorithms for the book. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the algorithm, show like a fun maybe application to life or something, and then an application to, like I said, a cybersecurity and running a cybersecurity department and work like things and things like that. Um, and then real quick, I wanted to show my absolute favorite quote from the book. I thought this was hilarious. Um, so I'm going to kind of steal it. And like, this is going to be my new quote going forward. You don't need a therapist, you need an algorithm. But it's a really interesting concept, basically just saying that if you make more choices in your life, backed by data and math and algorithms, you know, maybe you invite a little bit less chaos into your list. I thought it was really interesting. With that, I'm going to start getting into these algorithms, right? Um, the first one is called the optimal stopping algorithm. And to explain this algorithm, there's a really famous problem called the secretary problem. Um, and basically, the, the problem goes, let's say you needed to hire like an administrative assistant, okay? And you have 100 resumes of people that have applied for this job. Once you interview someone, you can either hire them, in which case you stop going through the resumes because you've found the person and you're done, or you can pass on them and keep going and interviewing the next person. And let's say that once you pass on someone, you can't go back and hire them later, right? You pass them, then you just go to the next person. So the problem of optimal stopping, right, is how many people do I interview before I hire someone? Because maybe I really like the second person, but if I hire the second person, well, what if the other 98 were way better and I just never knew it? And what if I took time and time and time to find the best person and I get to the last three people and they're all terrible, right? And now I've run out of batteries and I don't have anybody there. And I can't go back. So what is the optimal number of people to interview before you hire someone? Well, computer science will tell us that what you should do is interview 37% of all applicants, so in this case, 37 people, and not hire any of them because this is going to be what's called your searching phase, right? You're just looking to see what's out there. You're getting kind of a baseline of the population. So in the first 37%, you want to interview them all knowing that no matter what, no matter how much you like someone, you will not hire them, okay? But then once we get to our 37th person, we're going to take what we call our benchmark in the first 37. So who, who did we like the best? Who's our benchmark in our mind? And we can't go back and hire them, because we already passed. They're our benchmark. And then we're going to keep going forward and keep interviewing. And the first time we come across someone we like as much or better than that benchmark, you should hire them immediately and quit searching, right? 
And why is this the optimal approach? It's because if you're taking a sample size of a population, you're understanding what's out there, you're doing searching so you kind of know how to find the best person. And then the next time you see something that good, you stop immediately so you're not wasting time interviewing more and more people than you need to. So that's an algorithm. It's a really famous problem. So how did they apply this to dating, right? It's so interesting to me. So let's say the average person dates between the ages of 18 and 40. It's on average, right? These are all assumptions you can change. But what is the 37%, right? If you date between the ages of 18 and 40, what's your 37%? is 26.1 years old. It's technically the 37% mark. So what does that mean? It's like, well, by the time you get 26.1 years old, theoretically, you've dated 37% of the people that you could date, right? You've gotten your sample size and your population and you kind of know who's out there. And in theory, you've probably come across someone who would make a good life partner, right? You probably have by that age. Maybe not the absolute perfect person, but probably someone who you could have Pick to settle down with and probably could have tried to make it work, right? So to optimize dating, the theory is that you need to date until you're 26.1. Now, we don't encourage going back to your ex, right? So you can't go backward, but you say, who was your benchmark person that you met up until that point? And you realize that you probably had met someone that was good enough. And in the future, when you find someone as good or better than them, or whatever criteria you have, you commit to making a life with them, you commit to marrying them, you call it good, you stop searching, right? Of course, it's just an algorithm, like this doesn't always work like that, but it's kind of an interesting theory of how you can optimize looking for people. But other interesting applications of optimal stopping, parking is like a fun one, right? How, how far do you drive and get as close to you can to the place? Like how many parking spots do you pass before you say, this is probably as close as I'm going to get it. If I keep driving further, I might not see any more open spots. And then I have to <laughs> buying and selling houses, right? If you're thinking about buying a house, how many houses are you willing to go and look at? And then you have to make a decision. A lot of the times on the spot in the market of, am I going to put it off or you might have to make a day of decisions. So what you want to do is look at 37% of all the houses you're willing to look at. So maybe you're not willing to look at more than 20 houses. First 37%, don't put an offer on any of them, right? You're getting your skills, <laughs> you're trying to understand what's out of there. So let's actually apply this to cybersecurity. Hiring, I think, obviously, is an interesting application of it. We kind of went over that in the secretary problem. But understanding that you, not every candidate is going to be the absolute perfect candidate. So understand what's out there, get your sample size, and try to fix off that. But I think more importantly, what I see all the time is like, Evaluating products in the cybersecurity market. So there are so many different products for IAM, EM, all of these different things. And you can spend all day, every day, just talking to every startup, every new product, every vendor out there, right? Talking to other people and figuring out how they're implementing a tool or doing it differently than you. And a lot of the time, what I see it leads to is people jumping ship to a newer, better product because they think it's better without realizing how expensive and how much time it takes to ditch a tool that you've been using for a long time to try something better. And sometimes it is better to do that, right? But how do you know when those optimal solutions are? It's like, make sure you're always understanding about 37% of the market, right? If you're looking for a new IAM tool, you're not going to be able to look at every single startup that's come out there. Get your sample size, look at your 37%, and make an educated decision based on so algorithm number two is about scheduling, right? And so the first thing we'll talk about when it comes to scheduling is this concept of preemption. So preemption isn't free, meaning if, if you're doing something and something else is going to preempt it, there's a price you have to pay every time you're switching tasks, okay? And in computer science, it's known as a content switch. So every time you're switching tasks from going from email to a meeting or from a meeting to writing a documentation for something, your context is switching in your brain, and you're paying a price for that, and okay? you're not working optimally when you're going to switching. So when a computer processor switches its attention away from a given program, let's say if you're using Google Chrome and you, the computer, now you want to pull up a Microsoft Word document, it has to pause where it's at in the code for Google Chrome, put that code away, go find the code for Microsoft Word, pull it up, find the right portion of the code to run, and start running that program, right? Now, that all takes milliseconds, but it is context switching. 
and it's it's losing time. It's time that the computer is doing work, but not real work, right? It's not doing actual things. The work that it's doing is just spent in content searching. So this is one of the fundamental trade-offs of scheduling, is that the more you take on, the more you try to do, the more overhead and context switching there is. So the more time you actually waste. So then you get into this portion called thrashing. And, and basically, it's the concept that a CPU can actually only work on one program at a time. But it switches so fast that it looks like you can watch a movie, get an email notification, and surf the web all at once, right? But the more and more you try to get your computer to do, the, the more and more overhead there's going to be. And there's not, you know, it doesn't level up over time. There's actually a concept of thrashing, where basically, once you give it one more thing to do, and it hits a critical threshold, the system will die. It's like a really speedy drop off. And the best example of this is like, imagine someone juggling, okay? They're only actually throwing one ball at a time. But it looks like they're multiple, you know, throwing three balls at a time, but they're actually only throwing one ball at a time. And let's say you keep giving the juggler another ball, you add one more and one more, and they can juggle five and then six and seven. But you throw them that eighth ball and they don't know how to juggle eight balls at a time, they don't just drop one ball, everything, right? When you drop everything, it comes crashing down. And it's actually the same for a computer. And it's the same for humans. We have a, basically a thrashing threshold where once we try to take on too much, all of our time is spent content switching. And so if you've ever had to stop what you're doing because you're doing so many things, and you've got so much on your plate that you stop what you're doing and you write a list of all the things that you need to do, you, you're crashing, right? Because you're not actually working on anything productive. The work you're putting in is about context switching for the work you need to do. You're writing a list of everything that you need to do, but you're not actually doing any of those things. Which brings us to the trade-off of scheduling of responsiveness versus throughput. So the more programs that are running on a computer or in your mind, the, small, the smaller the slice of pie each program gets, right? So let's say you've got an hour to do something and you've got five things to do. If you had six things to do, each thing has a little bit less time to be done. When you add more and more and more stuff, everything has a smaller and smaller slice of the pie until that entire slice is just spent on preparing to do the next thing or finishing up the thing you previously did, context switching. And basically, these algorithms say there's a minimum length of time that you should do certain things to eliminate thrashing and to make sure that responsiveness doesn't obliterate throughput. So looking at real examples of this, the first really interesting one is responding to emails. Every time you navigate away from something that you're doing and writing a document or something to go respond to an email, you're, you're context switching and you are losing a little bit of efficiency, right? So do you need to be really, really responsive and respond to every email within five minutes of it coming into the inbox? Because if not, let's say in your head you've got a 30-minute email SLA, that means you should not check your email more than once every 30 minutes because that gives you the minimum amount of time you know, context switching. And on top of that, let's say you just sign on for the first time at 8 a.m., you know, first time of the day, and you've got 30 unread emails. What most people do, what I do, is I scan through all the emails and figure out which ones are the highest priority, and I start responding to those first, and then I kind of go down the list. When you do that, scanning through all of those emails is an example of memory regression because you're swapping every email in and out of your mind, which takes a lot of context. You're not actually responding to any of them. Then you have to go back to the ones you've decided you need to respond to first. And what's the first thing you do? You reread the entire email that you just read and start to figure out your response. So you're actually wasting a lot of time doing that. And for computer scientists who know, you know the speed at which algorithms run, this takes big O of n squared time, which means if your inbox is three times as full, it takes nine times as long just to scan through the emails to decide which ones to respond to. So an optimal way of responding to emails actually is just starting with the very first one you receive and going down the list. Read everything once and you respond and you, you kind of eliminate some of that memory crash. Another example of this, it's called interrupt coalescing. Basically all the interruptions you're gonna get throughout your day, if you can coalesce them into one time and then have longer blocks of times where you're not interrupted, you'll have pay less context switching prices. So great examples of this, if you're in management, hosting office hours, 
right, where you have an hour that anyone can pop on a fall or a bridge that you've got somewhere and ask your questions. That way you're not constantly getting pinged all day long, getting emails, getting random meeting requests or IMs. Because every time you navigate away to respond to that IM real quick, your, your contact switching. Another great example, and people hate it, is like weekly or daily update meetings where you've got five developers on a call and they're all giving their quick update for the day or the week. It's getting a really bad rap, but it's actually a, an idea of interrupt coalescing where everyone just gets on a call and for that 30 minutes, give your update. You know, you're not doing random updates in the middle of the day or anything. And for that 30 minutes, you get the interruptions out of the way and you go over the rest of the day. So those are some ways you can kind of use scheduling free to optimize, you know, what you're prioritizing and things like that for the day. And then the last algorithm I'll go over is called overfitting. So overfitting, I'll show this example here. We've got something that's like underfitted, a good fit, and overfit, right? Like statistical modeling. So the reason the one on the right is what we call overfitted, you might think, well, it goes through every single point. So it technically represents the data that's on that chart the best. But it cannot predict future data at all. It would be really, really bad at that, right? Whereas the middle one that we say is a good fit can probably more accurately predict future data. And they basically, this means the more and more factors you put into your line doesn't necessarily mean a better fit for the overall data. And the concept of this that applies to real life law, the more time that you give someone to do a task, or the more time you give yourself to do a task, the more complex they will make a solution. This is like a, a theory that's been looked at a lot in psychology, but it's really true. We're like, if there's a task that should take maybe around a day, and you have two days to get it done, and you give someone two days to do it, they inherently, and they won't even know that they do it, will make the solution more complex than it needs to be than if they had less time to get it done. And that kind of introduces this concept of Alan's razor, which you guys have might have heard of before. Um, but it basically means that given two alternative approaches to something or two answers to a potential question, the more simple approach is typically the best one. So it's like the old saying, when you hear of means you should make horse not semen, right? That's a really popular example. Or, you know, if you hear something knocking against the house, you should make against wind from a tree and not a burglar coming to murder you and steal all of your things, right? And this comes into the concept, which I think is really interesting, that if you cannot explain something simply, you probably don't understand it, right? So anytime you think you understand something, think to yourself, can I explain this very simply to like a 10-year-old? If you can't, you actually probably don't understand it very well. And examples of overfitting that we can apply to cybersecurity and to work the number one, the obvious one is over-engineering, right? There's so much complex over-engineering that happens in cybersecurity. Really, really complex systems. Um, I see it a lot in like development environments because my background is in computer science where, you know, they might set up really complex Docker containers because they think it's going to simplify deployment, but all of these things just go wrong. Over-engineering is, is really common in our industry and it's something you really need to be aware of to make sure you don't do in the future. Stopping when good enough, and that kind of goes back to the um, optimal stopping algorithm, right? But realizing that you might not need a whole week to do something, if you can get it done in two or three days and it's good enough, it might be time to move on. Because the next part of that is, don't let perfection be the enemy of good, right? It's a really common saying, I know everyone kind of says it, but it's a really good thing just to remember because there's a lot of times I've seen this, especially with like software architects or cybersecurity architects, where, you know, with cybersecurity, we're never going to be perfectly defended ever, no matter what we knew. We could, we could dump billions of dollars in our cybersecurity defense. And if someone really, really, really wanted to find a way into action, they probably could, right? So don't let perfection be the enemy of good and do what you can with what you have. And just to wrap up, um, I want to say, Life is not an algorithm. I understand that. Life doesn't work like this. It's not optimal, I get that. You can't always just respond to emails in the order they arrive in your inbox because there is such a thing as certain emails being more important. And if my CEO emails me, I respond immediately. I do not wait 30 minutes to minimize the context switching. I get it and I understand. And if life was optimal, 
my line, if it did follow algorithms, my line would look incredibly different than it does, <laughs> okay? So trust me, I do understand it. But the point of this talk was really just to be a good reminder to try new approaches to things sometimes. Think about the pros and cons for solutions and the way that you're going about something before you do it. Because humans, as people, do not act up. Like, we are our own worst enemy, and we're not optimal people, especially if we're making decisions without data. And a lot of time, we actually act against our own best interests inherently. And it's the reason that, you know, you say you want to lose 10 pounds, and then you have a burger and fries for dinner, right? It's acting against your own best interests because we're really bad at understanding deferred consequences or things that might happen in the future that we can't see right now. We're much more interested in like instant gratification or things we can actually see right in front of us, which does not lead to optimal decision making. So all of that was just to say, if we don't act optimally, try to you know, use an algorithm or some data next time to understand the decisions that you're going to make. Um, because it can actually help you really optimize and streamline a lot of things in both cybersecurity and your work life and apparently your dating life. So that's all I have. Um, yeah, I'm, and my background is actually like data science and analytics and cyber quantification. So super different. But if you want to talk about any of those things, I just threw my information up here. But yeah, if there's any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, that's all I go.